about um, the future of work and particularly happiness at work. So just to say about me, I, I am a statistician for my sins. Um, I, I'm a data guy. I, I was good at maths and I got sent off to Cambridge to do maths and I hated maths when I got to Cambridge because there were no numbers. <laughs> There was just Greek letters and lots of, sort of vague proofs about things, no, very specific proofs about things. And I started to change subjects, which you can do at Cambridge, and I basically found out I was an applied statistician. I wanted to change the world, and my weapon of choice was going to be numbers. And so, you know, I was really interested in social statistics. But I was also very interested in people. My, my mother was a family therapist, and I quite liked my mother, and I thought, you know, I quite like to understand how she sees the world. And so in my 20s, I also studied as a therapist. And... I really don't want to say I had a plan about this. It was a very random walk through life of me just basically trying to do things that I enjoyed doing. But I ended up, I guess, doing data about people and that merging those two things in together. And it's kind of probably what becomes my interesting point is that I can both do numbers and, and do people. In fact, I used to spend a lot of time in encounter groups sitting around in circles. I got very into the men's movement in my youth because I didn't really know how to be a man in a world that I found very um, misogynist and I wanted to understand how to do that. And most people talk about all sorts of stuff and I would talk about Excel spreadsheets and they thought I was quite crazy. Um, and then I would also you know, do exactly the opposite, start talking about um, people when I was doing my statistics. So I was trying to sort of merge that. And it all came together. You know, I, I, I ended up doing quality of life studies um, I ended up just doing what I thought was sensible, created something called the Happy Planet Index, which seemed to me a very straightforward idea, which is that the way we should look at nations is not GDP, we should look about how much well-being they produce, and we should look about how much of the planet they use to get there. To me, that just seemed a very logical idea, that the future should be good lives that don't cost the earth. But strangely, no one had thought about it before, and you, <laughs> and you or statistically thought about it before, um, and when you put numbers on it, it becomes quite powerful, and I got a TED talk out of that and all sorts of things. Um, but I became interested in work. My, my mother was a family therapist. My father was a business guy, ran a, ran a large business uh, for a long time. And I was interested in that. And he was very ahead of his times in lots of ways. So it comes together and I start thinking about work. And I think work is a particularly interesting point at the moment. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's change. Uh, technology is affecting everything. Um, and, you know, people are changing too. But the pace of change is, is more than we'd ever seen before. And we've got the rise of AI, robots, ever more capable machines coming. You know, what, how's that going to affect work? Um, and actually, you know, when we talk about millennials and people say, you know, they're different, they're not, they're still human beings. Human beings, we haven't evolved particularly in the last 20, 30 years. It's just that our technology has changed around us. So we're still the same types of people coping with that. And, you know, as a general rule, people aren't great at change. Um, you know, we quite like some stability. We do like change. We, you know, there's a sort of tension between the two. But innovation and everything about that is all about how we create that. And I want to talk about what makes us uniquely human, particularly when we think about robots and AI. And one of the things that is uniquely human, well, not uniquely human, but uniquely about being alive as a robot or AI isn't, is emotions, is that actually in our evolutionary history, Emotions came before cognition. We are sentient beings before we are cognitive ones. And the emotions are highly functional. You know, we haven't you know, evolved with emotions for no reason. They've helped us survive and thrive through the millennium. So you know, things like anger and fear are part of the fight and flight mechanism. And our emotions are basically built upon a stimulus response mechanism. How do we respond to the environments around us? And they're very fast-moving, quick, heuristics, you can call them if you want to, that help us act in the world. And if we think about the difference between emotions and cognition, uh, which we could, of course, call um, head and heart if we wanted to, um, then uh, and emotions are, um, one, is they're there to help us to ready to act in the world, two, is that they are always accomp accompanied with bodily feelings. Cognition is purely in the brain, as emotions we experience in the body, and that is about us readying to act. You know, when we uh, are angry, we're ready to sort of, you know, fight an injustice in the world or something that we don't feel is right. When we're frightened, we want to run away or freeze so a predator doesn't notice us. And these are uh, experiences that we get very, very quickly. When we don't express these, we hold them as tension in our bodies. So if you're feeling frightened at work and you don't actually sort of get up and run away or move or get crossed, then, you know, you get tense shoulders because your muscles are all working, readying you to act. So we hold them very much in the body. 
But what about the positive emotions? Until quite recently, psychologists tend to understand this as like a signal of good functioning, that when you're happy, everything's good, don't change anything. But more recently, they've started to understand that actually the positive emotions, and there's a whole array of them, from contentment, which is a low energy positive uh, emotion, to enthusiasm, which is a high energy one, that they're all about creating and seizing opportunities that they help us engage with the world more broadly. When we're in a good mood, we, we see the bigger picture more. I mean, in a bad mood, we tend to narrow down. They're both functional. It's not that the negative emotions are dysfunctional. They're functional too. They're helping us deal with threats. The positive emotions are helping us deal with opportunities and to create them. The reason the negative singles are stronger is because threats kill us pretty quickly. So in our evolutionary past, you know, if there was a saber-toothed tiger, we needed to deal with it very quickly. Whereas if there was a new bush of berries or, or a prey we wanted to do, you know, if we miss today, there might be another one tomorrow. And this is why I think the media is so negatively focused. It's a, it's a signal that we respond to very quickly and we, and we pay it attention, whereas the positive news just drifts over us a little bit. And this is why someone like Barbara Fredrickson, who's one of the great positive psychologists, talks about the need that we need to have three positive emotions for every negative. Her numbers are not necessarily specifically correct. And if we think about workplaces when they are, you know, um, characterised by positive emotions, they're, they're a lot more interesting and fun to work, they're a lot more creative. And I'll show you data on that, because as I said, I am a statistician. Now, AI. I was in a debate um, just two weeks ago in Germany with someone who's developing what's called Affex computing. And I thought, God, that sounds scary. And basically, he pointed an iPhone at my face, and he said, with 80% confidence, the iPhone can read my emotion. OK? It can certainly read your pulse. So just a, a video is reading your pulse now. You don't need to touch any of your body. So it can see whether you're in a calm state or an agitated state. And it can look at the fluidity of your face and work out your emotional experience. So I can 80% correct. And I thought, God, that sounds scary. And then you think about it. If you can remember that Microsoft little paper clip that used to clip up on Ding, and how bloody annoying it was of being so cheerful when it's popping up when you're just frustrated with your, with your Word document or whatever it was, and it goes, ah, can I help you? You know, <laughs> that if we actually get AI, which we are going to interact with, which actually is emotionally intelligent, that it is empathetic with us, surely this will make it the world much easier. You know, if you're driving a car which has got some self-driving facilities, Maybe it's really good if the car knows you're agitated, that actually it slows you down. So there's all sorts of ways it can respond to you. And if you would start going, medicine is a place that AI is going to come in a lot, you know, and I've sort of tended to say rather flippantly, well, that'd be great because, you know, the AI will do the diagnosis and then the doctor can be all nice and empathetic to you. And he goes, well, is your doctor empathetic? You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, most doctors are really rushing through the diagnosis because they've got two minutes or, you know, I think it takes 30 seconds before a doctor interrupts you in an appointment and starts to, uh, st steering you towards where they want to go. Well, you know, so maybe the, a computer will do uh, empathy better than we do. Certainly, I think if computers do diagnosis, it might free up doctors to have more than two minutes with you, and that will be good, and they can practice their human skills more. But it's just to say, <laughs> this is definitely coming. AI is coming because it might cost 10 million, 100 million to develop a smart piece of AI, but once you've developed it, the marginal cost of putting it into practice is, is hardly anything. So, you know, once you've made the best AI to do legal work or medical diagnosis, you know, all junior doctors are at risk all over the world because you just put the program in. And maybe this would be great in the third world developing countries. Maybe you'll have AI and really lovely nurses to look after you. You know, these are not necessarily bad futures. It's definitely, definitely coming. And you know, if we think about what emotional intelligence, people often put a lot of uh, stock on emotional intelligence and say we, we've got to be emotional intelligent and I would agree with that. I've trained as a therapist, I think that's one of the tasks of it. But I think the words are the wrong way around for when it means about what it is to be human. I think to be human it's about being intelligent, uh, intelligent emotionality. Our emotionality comes first. I think a wise person is someone that can access their depth of emotional experience and use their brain to choose how they respond to that. And the emotion is coming first. AI is never going to do this. It can simulate emotional intelligence. But a computer never feels anything. The computer that beat the Asian guy at Go, it won, but it didn't know it won. It didn't feel good for winning. 
So if we're going to think about what it is to be human, I think it is our emotionality which is absolutely central to who we are. And in that way, maybe we shouldn't be threatened by AI. Maybe it's about how we co-evolve with AI in our workplaces and how we use it, and how we use it for the best for our humanity. And there will be all sorts of knock-on effects. I mean, I think unemployment is a, is a worry, but you know, maybe we have citizens' income, and maybe we have dignity for all you know, without work. And we, we have to get rid of the Protestant work ethic, and we have to start thinking about what it is to be human. Maybe it's great that we can care for our elders, our children. We can play music. We can play video games if we like. It's not my buzz, but why should I judge if someone gets great experiences out of that, you know, if they're still a functional human being and bring up their children nicely? So you know, there's all sorts of possibilities that I think are going to open up here. But I just want to stay with that core thing. I think emotionality is core to who we are, and I think it's the core to the future of work. And earlier we talked about measuring happiness at work, a little bit of scepticism that we can measure happiness at work. I just want you all to look at that question. Okay? How happy were you at work this week? Okay, it's only Tuesday. You can think about last week if you want to, but whatever. I would imagine that all of you can pick a number there. Okay? I don't think it's difficult to. Uh, and, you know, some of you will hopefully be a four and a five. A few of you might be one or two. And some of you will be in the middle and you'll go, okay. Yeah? All I can say is if you've chosen three, you're not doing your best work. Uh, if you've chosen four or five, you, you can be into your best work stages. Uh, one, two, clearly something going wrong. Some weeks are bad. Um, but this is not difficult to measure. Okay? It's not the same as measuring your income to the last thing. It's not got decimal places. It's an indicator in the best sense of the word. It's indicating something. But you can do an awful lot with this data. I know, for example, that if a team, you take a team's average, and you move from you know, an average of three and a half to four, that the very next quarter, you'll have 17% uh, lower staff turnover, probably 7% higher productivity. These numbers predict future behavior very, very simply. Obviously, collecting this each week is non-trivial, but that's part of the game, getting people to give you honest answers. But the measurement of it, I don't think is very difficult. Um, just as an aside, because we talked about love, when you get into sort of questions which are more about meaning, uh, then it becomes much more difficult for us to put a number on it. So if I said how meaningful is your work, you'd find that much harder to say what it is. Okay? Whereas if you ask something about happiness, pleasure, it's easier to put a number on. And a lot of that is about the heuristics that work in the human brain. We have a very strong good-bad signal. Should we approach this? Should we not? That's part of our evolutionary history. Very, very helpful short-term heuristic. And this comes out in this sort of question. So um, I want to give you one example of what this data predicts, and it's about creativity. This is a very famous psychology experiment. Some of you may know it. It's called the Dunkel Candle Experiment. And it's a lateral thinking problem. So you're given uh, some matches, a box of tacks, and that's supposed to be a candle. Um, and you're asked to attach the candle to the wall in such a way that when you light it, it doesn't drip wax on the floor. It's a very simple thing when you know the answer, okay? But it, it, it blows people's minds, yeah? What you have to actually recognize in this box, in this box, I've just given the clue, is there's a box here. You empty the tacks, you tack the box to the wall, you put the candle in it, the wax doesn't drop to the wall. Some people solve this, some people don't. But what psychologists can do is they can manipulate your mood before you do it. So they have a control group. Don't manipulate anyone, just give it to you. 13% of people will solve that in 10 minutes in this experiment anyway. But they can manipulate some people into a bad mood. They might do that by showing you pictures of a, or no, listening to a baby screaming. That's going to make you very agitated, very hardwired into us to hear that. Okay, so you're going to feel very agitated and negative. Okay, do that. 20% of people solve it. That's kind of interesting that actually fear, anger motivate us, actually. They give us energy. I think this is why management by fear still works to a degree, because actually people are getting stimulated by it. They're agitated. Whereas you put them to positive mood, baby gurgling, cats playing, whatever it is you want to do, fully 70% of people, 75% of people solve it. And the reason is when we're in a good mood, we're in that creative space. We're not in our threat situation. We're thinking about how we solve it. So you think about this in your organization. If you want innovation, creativity, 
then actually thinking about the morale, the moods of your teams, the way you do it. If you're doing a brainstorming session, don't save the snacks and the, the treats to the end. Give people nice things at the beginning, you know, <laughs> because then you're setting them up to, to succeed. So, you know, it's a very, very strong thing going on. So what I would say is that happiness and success are interlinked. It is still true that when we're successful, we feel good. You know, that's the orthodox paradigm we live in, work hard and feel good. But from all the data I see, the link from happiness to success is at least twice as strong as the link from, happy, from success to happiness. There's a very virtuous cycle that goes on here. And um, I, I, I love the last talk. I see the world as, as not horizontal, but as cyclical all the time. I think of it very cyclically and everything learning is building on one thing or other. And this is a virtuous cycle. You can also get in a, in, a, in a vicious cycle where failure leads to unhappiness and unhappiness leads to more failure. It's neutral from a, from a, from a feedback perspective, pure engineering, it's called a reinforcing feedback loop. So it's, it, it's always uh, uh, working either way. So the future of work. Um, I think it's about building happily, uh, intelligently happy organizations. Okay, they, they need to be financially successful. We don't go to work to just, you know, listen to music. I like going to festivals, listening to music, whatever, like that. But, you know, that's not work, yeah? And so we do go to work to build things. It's actually one of the most meaningful parts of our work. And I think if we're going to create organisations, this should be the aim. And the question becomes, right, you know, kind of how do we do that? What are the drivers of it? I'm a statistician. I do big surveys. This is one we did with a place called Robert Half. It's a big global recruitment agency. We did a huge global survey, eight nations, 22,000 workers, all representative samples. It, they were American. They got very excited about my British accent and beard, so they called me the wizard of workplace happiness. You know, Harry Potter was in there, Gandalf. I don't know which one I was supposed to be, but, but um, you know, so, so, so this, I, I'm, I'm interested in data. I'm interested in empirical evidence of stuff. And what we basically showed is that there are five big ways to happiness at work, okay? Uh, we call these uh, connect relationships. Be fair. If you don't have fairness, anger's prevalent, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, empower, that's the autonomy we were seeing in the last slides. Uh, challenge, actually we like stretch, we like learning. Uh, and inspire, the purpose bit, the meaning bit of it all. The last three you can see Daniel Pinkin, if you know Drive, he talks about autonomy, uh, mastery and purpose. Uh, for some reason Americans are really poor on social. Uh, you know, they don't, you know, we're very socially motivated as creatures. You can see Maslow in there if you want to start with the be fair and move around. This is not, you know, new science in a sense. We're articulating it as positive things that people can do rather than the academic terms. But the data is all there that these are the sort of things that drive happiness at work. They're the ingredients of it. Now, I could leave it there and just say, there you go, there's the ingredients, there's the aim. But the how-to is really quite difficult. Oh, no, I don't think it's difficult, but I think it needs some thinking. And, and, it, and again, um, Practice, that's a good work. I talk about rituals, uh, that there's a rhythm to how we measure, and we need to build rituals around it. And, and one of the reasons I call my business Friday was I said, well, the church has Sunday, so we'll have Friday to think about what the rituals are about work. And this is the two big feedback loops that I think organizations need to put in if they're going to build a happier culture, a more positive one, a more productive one. One is built around the team. This is sort of like the agile way of working that we keep hearing about. So it's a fast feedback loop. We actually call it feeling fast and thinking slow. And if you've read your Daniel Kahneman, you know where I've stolen that from, um, his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. So the team is about you know, a weekly feedback loop. Like um, uh, tech teams, agile teams have a retrospective every two weeks at the end of their sprints, they look back on it. I think every week we should think about, you know, how was last week on a Monday morning? Let's think, how was it? How can this week be better? It's a very quick one. It's a little kind of quick and dirty um, about it, but it's very, very quick. And then you've got the more strategic, considered, slower one, which is what HR, company, uh, HR departments are most comfortable with. They're like the annual staff survey. I think annual's too long, but, you know, but it's basically how do we look at this data? How do we plan? How do we look at the systemic effects? That is still really valid. You know, I don't want people to throw away babies with bathwaters here, but I think you need to complement it with this very fast one. And these two don't really sit side by side. It's nice to look at it, but they really sit inside each other. The team sits within the organization. And if you're a team and the organization's changing and you're not, 
it's very discombobulating. You're thrown around that. It's like a ball, yeah? You're just thrown around. The organization's changing. It's very disorientating. And contrarily, if you're a team that wants to change and the organization's really resistant to it, you're a bit like that Greek god who has to keep pushing the stone up the wall because you're trying to climb up the inside of this loop. But if you get these two together, working together, turning in the same direction, it's kind of like when you're going through Heathrow Airport and you're walking along and then you get on the travelator and you're suddenly moving really, really quickly. It's when things go really, really well. And so if organisations want to become happier, I think it's about how do you align teams and organisations? How do you get that distributed responsibility to teams, the horizontal bit, if you want to say? How do you get that and how do you not throw away the strategic, considered, systemic things that need to go on? The two things need to work together. And I am a systems thinker, I am a statistician, uh, and so I sort of have these ideas and I really wanted to sort of build a product that actually makes that happen. And, um, and Friday, the organization uh, that I founded does that. I do want to say here that other products exist and that, you know, some of them are quite good. But what we do is we create a happiness KPI for each business that basically is, it, that is the good, bad signal. How do we know how things are going? You can look down and see how every team is faring every week, every month. And then we have more in-depth stuff around the five ways and how they're measuring and heat maps on that. Um, and we can look at, you know, the impact you'd have of focusing on one of those five ways about how it drives it. So really to summarize, the pace of change is getting faster. Uh, AI is coming very rapidly. Obviously, there are other things, you know, I don't want to forget climate change, uh, persistent inequalities in the world, these are still things going on. We seem to have some sort of democratic crisis going on at the moment, <laughs> don't quite understand the world. Um, and um, so these things are all happening. But remember that human emotions are highly functional, it's one of the things that makes us human. Our emotionality comes first. And that I think the future of work is about intelligent emotionality. We don't want to lose our brains either. You know, we've got big brains. Our mothers work very hard to get those brains out. And um, <laughs> let's not not use those. It's not all about um, emotionality. And the future of organizations is about building intelligently happy organizations. Uh, and that's where I think the future of work will be, maybe with fewer hours, which could be quite good, as AI takes up some of the slack, uh, uh, takes up some of the tasks that we really don't like doing. Um, so that's me, and that's what I think about the future work. <laughs> <laughs>